We're very pleased to have in the province and at the SUMA convention, Mike Lavecchio. Thank you, Randy. Uh, just a little bit about CP to start off. Uh, presence in many of your communities. We have 14,000 miles of track across North America. We're one of uh, six class one or large freight railroads. Uh, our reach is the entire continent. Some of you may have seen in the news that we're trying to extend that reach a little uh, down in the States. Um, today we're going to focus on, uh, on the world post lac Magotic, but uh, I know some of you have questions that are, are uh, stretched beyond that topic. Uh, know that as far as I'm concerned, ask any question you want, happy to address them, uh, happy to mock uh, my colleagues from Brand X uh, <laughs> who are not in the room. and. Uh, uh, with that, we'll get going. Um, this is an important stat for all of you with our presence in the community. CP has been North America's safest railroad for the last decade. Uh, these numbers are from 2014. Uh, we have continued that trend through 2015. We released the uh, 2015 numbers last week, so unfortunately they're not in this, uh, in this presentation. But know that the trend continues and CP's leadership in safety continues along with that. CP has been through a massive transformation in the last number of years. Uh, many of you who have terminals in our communities will know about that. Uh, just wanted to say the focus on safety, safety is one of our core values, uh, along with providing service. And as we have upped our game in terms of the service that we provide to the communities where we operate, we have maintained that focus on, on safety and that is reflected in these numbers. Now, Lac McGonick happened a number of years ago now, uh, a game changer for us in the industry, a game changer for you in terms of your preparation for an incident. The Transportation Safety Board, following the investigation, did one of probably the most exhaustive in investigation in their history into this incident. They identified 18 contributing factors, and you see them up on the, on the slide here. Uh, this wasn't a single failure. This was a total failure. And it's important to understand that context. The company involved in that incident uh, is no longer in business, but worth noting their safety culture did not exist and that, pr and that led to part of the failure. Part of the failure was also regulatory. There were exemptions given to, the, uh, to that operation uh, that, that in retrospect I think didn't make a lot of sense. The one that stands out for me uh, if I put on my other hat as a, as a train conductor was the single person crew. CP, we have always operated with two and in some cases more than two crew on board. Uh, the exemption to do the single person crew was granted solely to that railroad by Transport Canada and in my view it's that that is a very questionable decision. Now to be fair to Transport, post lac McGonick they have clarified that they're not going to give that sort of exemption again. So they too have learned a lesson here and, and I, think, I think that's going to be one of the themes that you hear as part of my present, presentation today is we have learned lessons out of this. Uh, one other thing that stands out from Lac McGonick uh, from the investigation. Uh, I was in uh, Wolseley, uh, I think it was about 10 days ago, meeting with council there. And uh, we're raising the train speed on our main line that runs through Wolseley by 10 miles an hour. There's a curve uh, just as you enter town from the east uh, that, that they had some concerns about the train speed as a result of that curve. And they raised the fact that in Lac Magotic, the train left the track on a curve. The track in Lac Magotic was rated for 10 miles an hour. The train was estimated to be traveling 72 miles an hour when it left the tracks. Remember, that train was completely out of control. So this is an apples 
to mountains comparison. Um, the, uh, but the fact that the train left the track, given the design of the track, given the curvature, is just a simple reflection of physics at the end of the day. There are standards for track speed. We maintain or exceed, we meet or exceed those standards. We can and we enforce track speed uh, and we always have. We have multiple ways that we enforce track speed. Uh, the CP Police Service does carry radar guns and they will turn them on trains. But more than that, most important perhaps, is on board each locomotive there's a black box that records, among other parameters, train speed at each location. So we know point to point what the, tra what the train speed is. Our train masters as part of our safety management system do routine downloads of those locomotive black boxes and ensure compliance. If a train crew is found to be out of compliance, meaning if they have exceeded the track speed for that given stretch of track, there's a formal investigation, statements are taken, and sanctions are levied. We take the operation of the train's compliance with the Canadian operating rules extremely seriously. We have to. Our credibility as an operating railroad rests on those rules. Um, so what's changed? First off, the regulations have changed, uh, and we'll dig into all of this. Uh, but more importantly, CP's emergency response capabilities have changed. Our outreach has changed, and the information sharing that we have with municipalities has changed. First off, on the regulatory change, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It's well documented. Transport Canada is nothing if not efficient at putting out news releases. But on crew size, we talked about that. Uh, no, no, uh, no train crews below two people. On train securement, uh, there's additional braking requirements. Uh, handbrake requirements for cars that are in storage, for cars that are stored on the main line, uh, for dangerous goods in particular. Uh, for uh, the DOT 111 tank car, the general service tank car, which is now uh, in advanced stages of being phased out, will be phased out by 2017. Its successor, the J1232, will be phased out by 2020, I believe it is, Randy. And uh, the uh, next generation of tank car beyond that uh, will be phased, will be put into service post-2020. In fact, some of them are already being manufactured. Uh, the difference between the 1230, the 1232 added shielding at either end of the tank car to the design. The uh, uh, TC-117, which is the next generation, will add jacket, heat jacketing to the tank cars for dangerous goods. What we found post Black Magonic with subsequent incidents involving the 1232 uh, was not so much that they were getting punctured at the end, but that as the heat of a fire burned for many hours, that, uh, that you would pass a thermal flashpoint in the tank and the tanks would then combust. So it wasn't the initial accident or incident causing the burn, causing the burn. it was the heat generated uh, post the incident, in some cases several hours after the incident had occurred. That, that was the case in, in Gogama, Ontario uh, with, uh, with another railroad. So the standards continue to evolve. Um, there, is, uh, there will be a, a, a test question on this for you coming up. Uh, under the Tra Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act, which uh, Transport Canada administers, uh, testing and documentation have evolved significantly. I can tell you uh, in the states related to Bakken crude, uh, North Dakota has greatly improved their testing that was one of the issues identified in, by the Transportation Safety Board in their investigation of Lac Magonic. The fact was uh, the product in the cars was mislabeled. 
wouldn't have made a difference to the outcome of the incident, but, but the testing and documentation associated with that product has improved significantly. Uh, the railroad industry itself has worked very closely with FCM. Randy's been a big part of that. Uh, and uh, information sharing as a result has changed significantly. Uh, and all municipalities are now entitled to information sharing direct from the railroads. There is a process to that. We, we can talk about that in, a in greater detail. Uh, emergency response plans have been extended from, uh, from some of the other dangerous goods that the railroads are mandated to move to crude oil and ethanol. And the railroads ourselves have recognized that we need to do more on the advocacy front and we have been very active in terms of supporting these measures. Uh, something that people don't realize about tank cars is the fact we don't own them. We are mandated to move them. The tank cars are owned by, by uh, the tank car industry themselves, by third party leasers, by product producers. We're simply mandated to move them. So in terms of moving the ball on the tank car standards, we can stand there and advocate until we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day we don't control whether or not those tank cars get changed. And we have been at the forefront of advocating for change. Now, you mentioned uh, our, uh, our emergency response equipment. I got a series of slides here that, that demonstrate some of the uh, some of the tools that we have brought on uh, brought in into bear. Um, first off, we have a series of this this slide just shows you some of the equipment that we have positioned across our network, and you will see that includes Saskatchewan. Uh, that's everything from firefighting foam trailers uh, to hazmat officers to uh, specially trained train masters to boom caches and emergency response transfer trailers. Uh, Dale, Dale here uh, has seen our, uh, our, our uh, transfer trailer in action with a, uh, an incident we had outside of Mortlock uh, a couple of summers ago. That trailer is fitted with every fitting in existence to connect to any tank car. It is based in uh, Calgary, so can be in Saskatchewan inside of five hours. Uh, we also have a series of environmental contractors present across the property who are our first response, but we augment that first response with our own resources. Uh, firefighting trailers, we have one stationed in Weyburn uh, we have another one stationed in Saskatoon. We have provided training on those trailers, and I'll flip to, uh, this, is, this is what the transfer trailer looks like. Um, here we have, these are our foam uh, firefighting trailers. We have 18 of these across the property. Uh, they can be moved in three, they can be moved by road, they can be moved by rail, and they can be helicoptered, and they were designed with those capabilities in mind. Uh, interestingly enough, we have not had to deploy one to a CP incident, but we did have one at Lac Magotic. Uh, we had one in Gogama in Ontario, we had one in North Dakota at a Burlington Northern incident there. Uh, actually, it was the one from Weyburn, I think, that went down to uh, down to across the border and went down to North Dakota. We do that through mutual aid with the other railroads. We can also count on their resources should we need them during an incident. Uh, this is the uh, boom container trailer. Uh, we have we have these positions strategically across the property, uh, and and again they can be easily transportable uh, across different modes. Uh, this is our operational command trailer. We have three of these. Uh, closest one is in Winnipeg. Um, this serves as an emergency command post. Uh, frequently with railroad incidents, we're not in a town center, we're out in the country, and the resources there uh, may be stretched as a result. The emergency command trailer uh, is completely wired, has the equipment on board, everything from computers to televisions, uh, and the cellular connections so that uh, or uh, cellular or um, uh, uh, 
sorry, uh, satellite so that we can communicate anywhere. Uh, finally, this is a new piece of equipment to our, uh, to our fleet. Uh, this has just been commissioned. It's a training tank car, and it is, it is specially fitted. It does the tour of fire departments every spring, summer, and fall, uh, where our dangerous goods officers and train masters will train fire departments directly. Uh, you can, you'll always know it because it's painted red. If you see it tied onto a train as it's passing through your community, it's on its way to a training session. That's its sole purpose. We've also significantly up increased our outreach activities. And some of you, I've appeared before your councils to talk about this. Uh, today is part of that. Um, but as you can see, the numbers are fairly substantial. We have a, a graded system of training, uh, starting with uh, awareness, awareness for first responders directly. We call that Railroad 101. It's led by our dangerous goods officers who, go, who reach out to fire departments directly and provide that training. If any of you wish that training for your fire department, if we haven't done it already, let me know. We'll get that arranged. Uh, we also do, this is a modified phase one. This is something I've done for a number of councils. General information for you as political leaders. Why do we do that? Because at the end of the day, the microphone is going to be stuck in your face should an incident occur in your community. We want you to have some basic knowledge that gives you some confidence in a very extraordinary situation which a derailment represents. Uh, we will do tabletop exercises. I'm a big fan of tabletop exercises. In the last year, we've done them in, Esti in, yes, in Estevan, in uh, Saskatoon, in uh, uh, Grenfell, uh, and in, uh, we did a modified one, I think, in Moose Jaw last summer. Um, we occasionally do full-scale mocks. I will tell you, I personally am not a big fan of them. I think they're exceptionally resource intensive uh, without any of the learnings that you don't gain through a tabletop exercise. I recognize they make for good television, which is sometimes the reason to do them, quite frankly. But, but in terms of testing your emergency plan, and that's what a tabletop is, it is equally effective to simply do it through a tabletop. Uh, finally, uh, we do uh, transcare training uh, jointly with the chemical industry. There's a specialized uh, 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 training tank car. It's painted blue. Um, it was in Moose Jaw last summer for uh, uh, an area-wide transcare training. Um, this is not specifically focused on crude. This is more on some of the other chemicals we move. And it is jointly supported by the Chemistry Council of Canada uh, and the railroads are, uh, work in partnership with our shipping customers to present that training. So significant training activities. Um, the final thing that we do is the railroads themselves established a training center down in Pueblo, Colorado. And we have been sending uh, firefighters down to Pueblo for the last three years for specific training on crude by rail. Uh, we send them down at railroad expense. The only thing we ask uh, that the local community pay is the drive from the fire hall to the airport. From that point on, it's on our dime. Uh, this has been a tremendously successful program for us. Um, this is a response we received from uh, the city of Regina following training that, that uh, Regina's hazmat team got down at Surtsey in, in Colorado. We have 80 seats a year at this training facility. Uh, again, if you have interest in sending your first responders there, we'll do a Railroad 101 with them first so that we establish a baseline of knowledge, and then we will put them on the list for training. Finally, on the community side, we, ha we now have a uh, community resource guide. This is downloadable from, uh, from the CP website. The, the address is at the bottom of the screen, and I can certainly send you that link directly. 
a lot of the information I'm imparting to you today is contained in that, uh, in that, uh, in that guide. Oops, jumped ahead there. Um, one other really neat tool, one of the requests that we have heard from a number of mayors, uh, a number of communities through FCM is a desire for real-time information on, uh, on dangerous goods. It's not always practical, that request. If we were to, say, email or fax a list of dangerous goods rolling through a given community on a given day, that would require a fire department to literally stand over that computer or fax machine nonstop. What instead the industry has developed is the Ask Rail app. And I have it on my iPhone. Um, looks just like you see on the screen. What this does, tank cars, all rail cars, have a series of letters and numbers on them. It's like a license plate, distinct for every rail car. If a given car derails, the fire, the fire department has the Ask Rail app. They can simply look it up in real time on, on the app. Right now, this app is only available for Apple products. Uh, we are, I believe, uh, the developers are working on, a, on an Android platform as well, but at the moment, it's, uh, it's Apple-based only. Beyond the information as to what's in the given car, it gives you the ability to look at, as you can see on, the, uh, on my left-hand side, uh, to see what's next to that rail car. So let's say the car in the middle is burning. You know what's on either side immediately. Now that doesn't change. The infor that same information has always been available on board the train. It's in the possession of the train conductor. Uh, and that continues. Plus, we have the Protection Directive 3.2 information disclosures that we provide to communities who register with Transport Canada on an annual basis. That information is segmented by quarter, giving you or your first responders really the ability to do some flow analysis. And people say, well, why don't we just tell the world what's on the train all the time? Why not, why not make it easy? Uh, there's a very simple reason. We don't want the bullseye on our train. We have to be realistic about the security environment in which we operate. We operate on both sides of the border. And there is significant sensitivity south of the border. But I would argue it's, it's everywhere, and it should be everywhere. That's why we don't advertise. That's why we don't put it up on billboards. On a need-to-know basis, that information is transmitted. Multiple channels now, including the Ask Rail app. Uh, just a little bit more about the app. It contains all the information that is in the TDG book that Transport Canada publishes, the orange book as it is known. So right in your phone, you have all the information that you could possibly need for an incident. That gets me to the next part. What needs to change? You can appreciate there has been a significant amount of change in the last three years, last four years. What needs to change? First off, greater acceptance of the proximity guidelines. These were jointly developed by, by the rail industry and FCM, adopted uh, at FCM 2012, updated in 2013. Surely, in a post lac McGonick world, we are all smart enough to think through locating people, schools, community centers, housing in direct proximity to a major industrial activity such as railroading. But that's something that is completely within your control. The guidelines are there for your use as your councils. I encourage each of you to adopt them as part of your planning guidelines. We're not going to change what's already there. 
That's not what the guidelines are about. The guidelines speak to the future. And there are some responsibilities. Why is it so attractive to, to redevelop land in direct proximity to the tracks? This is something that's going on in Regina right now. Why is it so attractive? Well, obviously, the land is cheaper. So you're a developer. You're going to make more money building your condo tower next to the tracks than you are a kilometer away. That's where you, as municipal leaders, come in. We need your guidance on this one. We need you to implement the proximity guidelines. I sit on the, uh, on the RAC FCM uh, Government Affairs Committee for Proximity. Uh, we have a very robust engagement that we're going to be doing this year. Cynthia Lullum is the project manager on that. Cynthia is a Westmount City Councilor, probably known to most of you. She's a fantastic resource. She will happily come meet with your planners. Uh, again, strongly encourage you to take this one. That takes me to infrastructure. Now this slide will be a little hard to see because there's so many dots on it. This is our Weyburn subdivision between uh, Wilcox and Weyburn and the city of Weyburn, paralleling Highway 39. All those yellow dots are level crossings. The level crossing for us in the railroad business is the biggest risk that we do not control. Somebody's decision to try and beat the train, somebody's decision to use the train to take their own lives, somebody's inattention never works out well for them and can be disastrous for us all. Uh, and we saw that in uh, Dale, I'm sorry to keep, to keep pointing to you, but we saw that outside of Mortlock, uh, where uh, we had a derailment in Mortlock. Three weeks later, we had another one because one of our contractors, a truck driver, uh, tried to beat the train, stumbled in front of the train in his dump truck. Train hit the truck and derailed. I mean, Candidly, sometimes you can't make this stuff up. And that one, that was, to my mind, that was ridiculous. Uh, we have gone back with our contractors. We now have a program called eRailSafe that any contractor on CP property must be through in advance. And that was one of the learnings out of that incident that, frankly, the judgment of some of our contractors was very poor. Can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to explain to our senior vice president of operations, to our president, to our CEO, how one of our contractors caused a derailment? For us, the loss of the main line is the single biggest disaster that can hit a railroad. We only make money if the good gets from A to B, and any delay in that impacts our revenue stream. We are extremely motivated to have a safe and reliable operation because it's the only way we get paid at the end of the day. So that brings me back to infrastructure. I am realistic enough to know that most of you in this room do not have the municipal budgets to build overpasses yourself. It is an issue that needs to be tackled with all levels of government. It is one in which we want to be your advocate. But I want to leave you with the thought, as you can see on this map, that perhaps the grid road system that, that Saskatchewan has enjoyed for generations is incompatible with an efficient freight rail network. And at the end of the day, an efficient freight rail network is vital to Saskatchewan's economy. It's vital to the health of your communities. This is something we're going to have to work on together. We're trying to do that in a couple of locations now in Saskatchewan. It is remarkably difficult to get a crossing closed, far more than I ever imagined when I got into this. Nobody wants to give up the convenience of the crossing that they might use once or twice a year, a month, a week, a day, even if there's a crossing a mile away. And I get that. 
I'm a driver too. I spend an, an insane amount of time on the road, as you might guess. You want to have options. That said, today's freight train is, is long. It's growing longer. At CP, our average freight train length is about 7,500 feet. We'd like to see that grow to 85 or 9,000 feet. Our big intermodal trains typically come out at more than 10,000 feet. Grain trains, we want to grow those. Right now, they average about, about 7,000 feet. We'd like to see that grow to 8,500 feet. For us, it's a better use of resources. At the end of the day, if we're going to provide an efficient service, and, and anybody who remembers the winter of 2014 knows the uh, meat grinder that we went through on grain service. Perhaps we deserved it, perhaps we didn't. We don't want to be in that situation again, so we're going to do what it takes to increase our efficiency, to increase our, pred our predictability and our reliability. Part of that is increasing capacity. The easiest way to grow capacity is to add cars to the train. But there are practical implications to that. If we have to stop a train for any reason, the Canadian operating rules dictate that we cannot stand on the crossing for more than five minutes. I look down at Estevan, where uh, the Estevan bypass has just gone in, and lo and behold, right in front of the Patterson elevator is where the cut across our main line was placed for, for the Estevan bypass. It has severely limited our ability to efficiently serve Patterson. We made that point to highways and infrastructure when they were in the design phase. We said it's a core location for the crossing. Given, given the nature of the product of the project, why don't you grade separate it as part of the project? Patterson made the same point to the government. You know what we were told? It costs too much. Well, you know, if you're going to have infrastructure, do it properly. It's a one-time cost. It's not. Instead, they took the quote-unquote inexpensive route, and, and that has limited what is, for us, a very important assembly point for grain trains. This is reality. Saskatoon, we have this discussion all the time with the city. We're now, uh, we're now, we have formed a committee between the industry and the city to look at how to advance grade separations, recognizing that the tracks probably are not going to leave town anytime soon. Uh, in Brandon, Manitoba, we've got the reverse of a problem. Uh, there's a, uh, a city-owned roadway bridge over our main line that uh, is at the end of its, of its life. Uh, it was uh, taken out of service for vehicles last year, and the engineering report made it clear it's beyond repair. It's got to be taken down. So the city of Brandon is going to incur the cost of taking down a bridge over top an active rail line. Let me tell you, that's not cheap. And then they've got to figure out what to do in terms of replacement. There's no way municipalities alone should be carrying that burden. But I think the request starts with you. There is a significant amount of infrastructure money out there. I think we all agree that freight rail is in the public interest. I think we all agree that public safety is in the public interest. And they intersect at the overpass or underpass. This is something we should be working together on. With that, I want to leave you with one final thing. Please make sure the CP emergency line is in your community emergency plan. Anything happens in your community, this is the number you call. It is, uh, it is in operation 24-7. You want to skip the prompts, push 1-1. One, one, and you will get right to the uh, police communication center. It is our first point of contact. It is the number that is on the back of every set of cross bucks across this country. Most of you have my phone number. You know how to reach me. That's good. But occasionally I sleep. Occasionally I go on vacation. 
in an emergent situation, you don't want to be trying to figure out my schedule. This is the number to call. With that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. As I said, lots of opportunity for question here. The idea is to learn. So have at it. Doug Barker, Mayor of Kyle. With all the short line railroads that we have now in the communities in Saskatchewan, who is responsible for them? Like if they derail, they don't have their own response teams. They don't have nothing. So who do we call or who do we get uh, our fire departments to train on these short rail? It's a great question. It's a great question. The provincial short lines, if they do not cross a provincial boundary, and the majority of the Saskatchewan short lines do not cross a provincial boundary, are provincially regulated by the Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure. In most cases, those companies are moving grain. There are a couple of exceptions mm -hmm. uh, where they are moving crude. Um, and in some cases in very significant volume. And I'm not personally familiar with Kyle, so I can't tell you whether or not... It's Elrose right beside us. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Um, frankly, it's something we've flagged for the government of Saskatchewan, the fact that, uh, in our view, there is some risk there. Uh, I, know, I know the government has moved to up the... Uh, uh, the insurance liability requirement for those short line companies but short lines when as a policy tool when they came into being were a way to keep the prairie the country grain elevators in service when they were no longer economic for the big railroads to serve to service them we obviously have at cp a much higher cost structure than your average short line i don't think anybody envisioned crude oil when the policy was written and frankly there are some questions that we would like answered on that point as well um, they don't have the same training resources but the same rules do apply to them the Canadian operating rules apply to all railroads they have to be in compliance with those rules um, and but the same forces of economics also apply to them if they lose uh, if they lose service on their line, well, then they're just costing money. So it's in their interest to have plans in place. Um, I don't believe anybody is in the room today from the Saskatchewan Short Line Association, but they're, act they're a fairly active group. I would encourage you to reach out to them and have that discussion directly. Will CP go out to uh, hazmat team to these short line disasters? If uh, if asked on mutual aid, yes. Okay. But but it, it it occurs through mutual aid. We don't self deploy <laughs> except to our own events. Thank you. Uh, maybe just to say that uh, Suma is very aware of what's going on with short lines. The fact that they aren't following on un falling under the uh, standards set under federal regulations. What we've advocated for and continue to advocate for is the same um, requirements across the board for anyone carrying dangerous goods, regardless of whether you're talking about a short line or a major carrier. Uh, the government has been somewhat receptive on that. Certainly they increased the insurance requirements. It's not quite up to what the federal standards are, um, but in their view, it's enough to cover should an incident happen. We're talking about shorter trains that do tend to go a little bit slower. With any luck, any derailment event would be a, a smaller uh, price than it might happen with a, a larger carrier. So. We continue to advocate for that, uh, certainly on the federal grade crossings, um, which are coming into place for the federal carriers now. Uh, the province is looking at how those will apply to short lines, and it's something that we're very much staying on top of and making sure that they, if they do roll it out, we know exactly what that's going to look like from a municipal context as well. Uh, from my own experience, uh, to speak to the question of uh, who responds, it's your local fire department. Um, there's nobody else. So 90% uh, of the time it's gonna be a local fi fire department, generally calling in mutual aid, if you have a mutual aid agreement in place. There is the possibility, uh, or there used to be, I'm not sure where exactly it sits right now, but the province has a c uh, small subsection of responders that they can send from Prince Albert. Uh, but that's generally when you have a, a long burning fire or something like that where they have time to get down there. So 
it really is mostly your local fire departments. My name is Melanie Clark. I'm from the village of Vanguard. I'm at the very beginning. You showed a, a sign talking about accidents and stuff. That doesn't include derailments, does it? Yes. It does. It okay. Because I w okay, then I'm being misinformed because I thought derailments didn't weren't included in accidents. So that was just one thing I wanted to ask. And can I just clarify? You said that you're not supposed to block a crossing for more than five minutes because I work in Herbert, Saskatchewan, hmm. and Swift Current is my main yep. hospital. And I'm also a medical first responder, and I know I've got a 45-minute wait for an ambulance to come to Vanguard. Then I've got a 45-minute drive, well, probably 40 at the speed we would be going. And I have definitely spent 20 minutes waiting for a train in Swift Current, and I quite often, there's a tr uh, train that goes through Herbert, for instance, sort of 3.20 every day as I get out of school, and that's not five minutes. I mean, I, I turn my car off, I open the windows, I get out the phone, I get out the book. Yep. It's not five minutes. So <laughs> that's kind of what I'm wondering there. Sure, happy, happy to address that. Thank you for the question. Uh, the Canadian operating, the specific Canadian operating, uh, railway operating rule is 103D. The rule says a train cannot stand stationary on a crossing for more than five minutes. Trains can switch over a crossing indefinitely. However, however, if, if people are observed to be waiting at the crossing, the train is to clear the crossing. If a first responder is waiting at the crossing, the crew are to clear the crossing immediately. That's the rule. How do we enforce that rule? Because to your point, people wait all the time. Again, we do that through downloads in the black box. If you have a specific crossing where you observe, we're not always gonna, we're not gonna have eyes everywhere all the time. Make that report through CP Community Connect, um, which uh, I'm not quite sure why this is displaying the way it is, but CP Community Connect at the bottom or through the CP Police Service. My crossing is blocked. It is X time of day. I see locomotive number whatever. We'll investigate it. Um, we do not want to be out of compliance with the rules. Now, there are going to be times when it's solely out of our hands. And this is, in, you know, this is very germane to Saskatchewan in particular. CP, CP mainline track is largely single line, one track with sidings. You've all seen trains and sidings waiting for a meeting train. You've all heard them idling in the middle of the night in your communities. You know about these. Um, in, in some cases, if it's a poorly planned meet, they do occur. Um, a crossing may be blocked. The crew is supposed to split the train at the crossing when that happens. It doesn't always happen that way. They are technically in violation when that occurs. Again, we want to know about it. We will do an investigation, and if they are, in, if we can confirm they were in violation, there will be sanction. But as I said, we don't have eyes everywhere all the time, and we expect our crews to follow the rules. When they don't, we want to deal with it. You can, send, you can contact the CP Police Service or you can send a note to CP Community Connect, either one. Doug R. Brewster, Todd Raybor, we like you, but we got the other guys, unfortunately. Um, our experience, I'm the, the EMO for our town as well, and we have, oh, wonderful, we have, we have two crossings that get covered very quickly with a long train. And so we've had experience where our EMS comes from less stock. Our EMS can get stuck on the one side of the train separ being separated from town. And we've had very good response from CN where I've called and said, hey, I'm sitting on one side. There's like 20 cars on either side. What's going on? Call the CN police within five minutes. They had the train moved or split. So we've had very good, and I'm sure CP is the yep. same. You just have to be firm and say and have that number of the of the act 
I just say this is the act. This is how long the trade's been sitting there. And if the trade moves at all, it resets the clock. So you got to make and make sure you have the locomotive number, and they will they will respond extremely quickly to you. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Uh, Deb Higgins, Mayor of the City of Moose Jaw. First off, uh, I want to thank you for how CP has really stepped up, uh, and I think the rail industry in general, but CP in particular is what I would notice because it's a main part of Moose Jaw. Um, how you've stepped up to the education and the public information that has happened. And I also know that uh, our fire department has benefited greatly from from the training that's provided through CP. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, I think it provides a good level of, well, better understanding, but also a level of comfort in the community because most of our communities were built around the railway. Yep. Uh, so most of the tracks run right through the center of our cities. Uh, first, a couple questions. So I want to thank you for that, but a couple questions. Is the rail app to check what is in the cars or if they're loaded or not, is that available to anyone or do you have to be a professional or EMS or something to be able to access it? Sure. Available to anyone? It is not available to anyone. Okay. We want, at a minimum, we want first respond it's it's for first responders and we want them to at least have had railroad 101 training prior to prior to uh providing them the link to the app okay uh, it's not it is not available on the app store uh it is it is done through our uh, a service provider directly okay thank uh, you I do think I do think Moose Jaw Fire has it, by the uh, way. Well, I would expect they do, but I thought, oh, that'd be kind of interesting. But then I was thinking, well, but it's not really information yep. that you would want Correct. accessible to the general public. Correct. Uh, so thanks for that clarification. Also, I had a question, or we had a question at council the other night from a resident and a bit of a complaint as to how fast trains were entering and exiting the city of Moose Jaw. What are the speed limits, and do they vary between villages and where the trains are located? Because it would be nice to be able to give him a response, and you being here makes it much easier than me looking it up. <laughs> you bet. Um, it's actually it's a great question. It does vary from location to location. I can't remember on the Swift Current and Indian Head subdivisions, which border either side of, of Moose Jaw, what the track speed is off the top of my head. I think it's 50 miles an hour, but I'm not positive. Once you enter Moose Jaw and you're within yard limits, it is 15 miles an hour through the city within Moose Jaw Yard. 15? One five. Ooh, perfect. And if we have a concern that they're traveling more than that, because I know you said black boxes are checked randomly periodically whatever but are they checked on a regular basis they or are. a specific they so are. we would know if they were or if an inquiry was made you would know if they were leaving town quicker than that yes okay there are eyes especially on the yard there are eyes on the yard almost all the time okay and the uh our train masters are mandated to do these proficiency tests um and it's actually a significant number of them. It's in excess of 50 per train master per month. Okay. So the spot checks are happening quite frequently. I will say this. If you, if you are close to a train, you realize just how large they actually are. Our depth perception is not geared towards a train directly. And, and so people will, just because of the size of the thing, because of the noise and vibration, they will on occasion perceive a train to be going faster than it is or slower than it is. But it, it, it has to do with the, with the human scale. We're used to seeing them in a bit of a distance. Up close, they really are quite a bit bigger than we realize. So, so sometimes, especially members of the public at large, will perceive will perceive something that's not actually fact. And, and just be aware of that. 
And the only other thing, if you could do a bit of a conversion for me, you had said that uh, the intention to increase efficiencies was to uh, move grain trains up to 10,000 feet? Up to about 8,000. 8,000 feet? Yep. You said one 10,000, one 8,500, but uh, okay, I'm trying to convert between metric and <laughs> what is that in miles? Uh, a uh, 10,000, a, a a, a, an 11,000-foot train is two miles. Is two miles. Okay. That covers a lot one of mi crossings. One mile is, is 5,622 feet. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, and the, I should say, you know, the railroads, being, being the ornery organizations we are, we never converted to metric. Malcolm Kuntz, uh, Mary Raymore. Just a qu question on clarification on uh, uh, if it's federal or provincial that they follow. Like we had a uh, train upgrade, a uh, second line put in, and they're running 24-hour uh, uh, crews. And the noise I was going through with them work and the beepers, the, you know, tried to keep them quiet. And yep. they told me that they're feder federally legislated and they don't really care about the town bylaw. Is that true? Uh, municipal bylaws do not apply to railroad operations for federally regulated. And, and so you are correct. Uh, Don Looning, City Councilor, uh, City of Moose Jaw, and SUMA, Board of Director. Um, just as an example, Mike, um, because as you know, my spouse is a conductor with CP Rail and has been for 25-ish years. Um, it's a very complicated business that I think a lot of people don't understand. I, I appreciated your comment about how big the train is because I've been up close to one. I've been fortunate enough to see them and they're pretty, you know, it's, it's an incredible piece of equipment. But with this extension in the length of the trains, um, I also don't think that the average person understands how long it takes this equipment to stop. And as I was mentioning to you last night, the things that the crew sees on the train that they have absolutely no control over because they can't stop. And um, and even after 25 years, I still don't understand all of it, so I'm not gonna stand here and, and say something because I might say something wrong, but um, you know, the things that they see, I was telling some of the board members last night that you know my husband has watched a school bus coming up to a crossing, slamming on the brakes at the last minute because the bus realizes it's not gonna beat the train and the train barely misses the school bus full of children. And it's things like that, that you know the train isn't able to stop. And I think sometimes our municipalities take a lot of, you know, they were, <laughs> They were there before the municipalities were, and it, they're really not going anywhere. And I think the, the conversations that we've had with you over the years is very valuable to us as politicians and, and uh, you know, residents because there needs to be more understanding about how um, the rail is, you know, public safety is important, but there's just so many factors that are out of the crews control, um, they are following the ro rules and regulations, and, and um, so it's not really a question, but I guess I just wanted to thank you for, you know, coming, you know, out and, and sharing some of this stuff with us and continuing to do so, because the understanding about what, you know, the crews go through and the long hours that they work, Mike and I have had this conversation before, I mean, some of these men and women work, it's not an eight-hour workday. These nope. days are sometimes 24 and 48 hours long, and they flip around and come back from Swift Current or Broadview or whatever, and they're you know they're mandated a l some rest, but oftentimes it's not. Anyways, so there's a lot of factors that are out of our control, but I think some of the key issues are um, you know it takes a long time for this equipment to stop, and uh, and we all need to be just more aware that the train is going to win every single time. I don't know. I, Don, you nailed it. Um, those of you that, that weren't with us last night, a number of us had a, had a drink together, and I was relaying a couple of stories to Don, and she was relaying a couple of stories to me. And I, I mean, I, I am grateful to have advocates like Don around because, because of her spouse. She has an understanding of the railroad, and Deb, it's true of both Debs, it's true of you as well. Um, you have an understanding of the railroad that is somewhat unique in municipal politics, and it's helpful to me. If 
but we were talking about grade crossings and about uh, incidents. And I was relaying to everyone at the table uh, about an incident that I've been dealing with out of, uh, uh, out of Cochrane, Alberta. Uh, this past summer in Cochrane, uh, three weeks apart, we had two teenagers uh, involved in train versus trespassers. One was wearing uh, earphones, just didn't hear the train. The other one was a suicide. And for the crew, you know, always remember, there's no steering wheel on board the train. There's no ability to swerve. And it can take up to a mile to slow a fully loaded train. A potash train, the heaviest train we run is, our, is the potash trains, the camp attacks cars. That thing at track speed is going to take a mile to stop. So, thank you. And for the crew, they're the first witnesses. And there's nothing they can do. They can put the train into emergency or not. The rule is actually interesting. The rule gives that option to the crew. In some cases, the best thing to do is not to put the train into emergency. The, there, there's tremendous physical forces inside a heavy freight train. And if you hit the emergency brake, it releases the air throughout the train all at once. So the binders come on, the, the brake shoes come on the wheels, and the train comes to a screeching st stop. If you're, in a, if you're in an area with significant curves, and most of my railroading has been out in British Columbia, where we have a lot of significant curves and grades, you know, as an experienced crew member, how your train is going to behave. It may be better to bring that train to a controlled stop as opposed to blowing the emergency brake and risking a derailment. So the rule leaves it to the crew to decide. The reality is the same. There's no hope of being able to stop in time. It's the reason trains have the priority at crossings. It's actually a very pragmatic recognition of physics. But I would ask that you, you take Don's comments away um, and, and, and take them to heart because for the crews involved, there is no worse situation than a, you know, whether it's a student, whether it's a senior, doesn't really, the knowledge that you have participated in somebody's death is horrific. Well, we'll look after our people. We give them critical stress counseling, we give them the time they need to recover, and we do that very willingly. That doesn't change the fact that it can change somebody's life in an instant. It's not just the person who dies at the scene. There are others involved as well. As a conductor, I've, I haven't had uh, a fatality myself. I have had three near misses. Uh, the first one occurred when I was still doing my training. Uh, it was 3 o'clock in the morning. We were coming down through Hope, British Columbia. You don't really expect to see a cyclist at 3 o'clock in the morning at a crossing. This one ducked around the crossing gates. We lost sight of him below the nose of the locomotive. And um, we were fairly certain we had hit him until we saw him come out the other side. But, you know, we missed him by nothing. Uh, 20 minutes later, I had to shake so bad I had to relinquish the conductor's chair to my conductor coach. It's part of the reason that we do the training we do the way we do it is we've got to harden up as operating employees. We've got to learn that lesson. And you do learn the lesson. And you learn to survive. You learn to, to manage it. And the company backs you up with resources as needed. But it's an awful position to put a couple of people who are just trying to earn a living, it's an awful thing to do to put them in that position. What Randy's alluding to is what we referred to as the day from hell in Yorkton. Um, if it could have gone wrong, it went wrong. But Yorkton, which is bisected by both main lines, um, 
in fact they cross over each other in within the city limit uh, is a particularly challenging operating environment for for a railroad and there are huge impacts to residents of Yorkton as a result of the layout of the city and the layout of the tracks um, the crossing arms right now they're in they're at about half the crossings I think they're about hundred and fifty thousand dollars to install uh, it is the responsibility of the road authority so in this case the city of Yorkton uh, outside of Yorkton it would be highways and infrastructure uh, to incur that cost Transport Canada does have a grade crossing improvement program that provides some minimal funding uh, spread out across the country for communities in need. Part of that is an assessment of the crossing. Uh, I would say, uh, from experience, Yorkton has a pretty good business case to make for that for that funding, owing to uh, the some of the unique layout inside the city limit. But that said there's never going to be enough money for this and in terms of urgency uh, you get people's attention when you have a day from hell like like Yorkton had uh, and people expect you know voters expect action now and they don't necessarily go to their member of parliament they don't necessarily go to their MLA they go to City Hall and they say do something about this so the program is out there um, the decisions are typically made in the spring there's an application there's a process uh, but it's a good time it, in terms of need to assess there is an engineering report that has to be done as part of this funding process um, the new grade crossing regulation came into force just before Christmas the federal grade crossing regulation that applies at every grade crossing across the country you who are road authorities are obligated under the new regulation to do a safety assessment of your crossing I think it's within five years or seven years so this is something that given that you're gonna have to do this in any case it's probably a good question to ask the consultant that you hire to do the assessment should we be planning now for some capital to upgrade the crossing the formula works like this under the grade crossing improvement program transport Canada will pay up to 50 percent we as a railroad will pay up to 25 percent and the road authority is responsible for the remainder uh, but as I said it's a national program uh, TC used to pay a lot more of it they reduced their contribution and they weren't they didn't reduce the amount of money available to the program they re they reduced their contribution with the idea that they could spread the money further it hasn't really worked that way um, mostly because our contribution went up significantly from the railroad industry as a result and you know at CP we have a capital plan for 2016 of 1.1 billion dollars about 782 million of that will be dedicated to day-to-day -to -day maintenance uh, track maintenance that sort of thing the remainder we use for some of our growth projects such as the uh, rail spur that we're building right now up to the K plus S legacy mine um, in short we don't have oodles of cash to devote to the grade crossing improvement program we've got to focus on our own infrastructure um, and and we're not a, at the end of the day we're not a road authority so the program has been kind of uneven in how it's been applied uh, but given that all of you are going to face this this safety review in any case to my mind now's a good time to ask the question as part of the report that your consultant repair prepares should we be upgrading and it gives you some time to plan and the ability to dedicate some capital over time
Uh, Linda Andrew, Coppell, Mayor of Coppell. Um, I do understand a lot about the railroad because my, my family spans three generations of working for the railroad in all different aspects. But my question is a little bit off, not a lot, but a little bit off. We have an underpass yep. of the main line. And we've had many issues over this underpass because we have a lot of children that like to seem to like to play around it. And it's gone generation after generation that they like to do their graffiti, et cetera. Yep. We have got to the point where they're no longer doing the graffiti, the odd time. My issue is that we have an issue with the maintenance. I realize, I know that if there is a fire around those rails that they become weakened. And we have a lot of trees and brush and shrubs around this overpass that we have discussed with them over and over and over again. And the issue that what I get back from them is I actually had a chat with the gentleman out of Swift Current who came out and I was basically brushed off that I was female, I didn't know what I was talking about, and that, oh yes, this should be done, this should be done, and nothing has ever happened. The brush has gotten worse. CP, at one point, I was discussing it with someone out of Calgary, and they said, you let us know, we'll stop the trains, and you can use your fire department to get rid of the brush. We had an RCMP tell us, just throw a match to it as you go by. This is how bad this <laughs> issue has gotten, <laughs> to the point where we actually stopped payment on our crossing because they weren't maintaining it. So my question is, and I can come up to you later, but who do I need to talk to to get this issue straightened out? I'm the guy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he's here till the end of the convention. <laughs> 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 That's, well, the number of people who have a relative <laughs> who is a co-worker of mine or was a co-worker of mine in a previous generation blows my mind. Um, you know, at the, height of C, at the height of sort of CP Limited, before the various divisions were broken off, we, had, we employed over 200,000 Canadians. Um, and and the, the the number of people who have in their blood some CP some time with CP blows my mind. Anyway. Next question. Yep. Uh, Rebecca Titoju, councillor from White City. Uh, I just um, thought I would buttress what uh, Dawn said from Moose Jaw uh, because when she said it, I was thinking. It's an important point. Uh, for me, as people would say, they have childhood um, memories. Uh, my dad was a, a railway worker, and I traveled all my life. It was fun uh, when I was growing up, up to high school, and that was our means of transportation. Uh, I'm not sure if I've seen this, but I'm suggesting if it's something that could be considered when she was talking about safety and letting people know that it takes this long or this amount of time for a train to stop. Even though uh, we talk of common sense, but we have a friend who said common sense is not common. And uh, we've Ain't seen it uh, behind uh, the school bus or a trailer that will say yep. this, this uh, vehicle stops at every intersection. So which means there's a warning for a driver behind uh, that vehicle to know that this vehicle can stop at any time. If we haven't done one, I, I really want to suggest that maybe putting on the uh, uh, real cars that it could take uh, one mile walk or drive for this train to stop. Uh, it doesn't sound right, but at the same time just to do things. And I, I remember growing up, one of the things that we were also told that I still remember that anytime I come to the crossing is the magnet. I'm not sure if it was a uh, uh, this tale, uh, old tale stories that you were told that uh, the train has some sort of a magnet. If you go to a certain um, uh, distance, you can actually be, be drawn in. I don't know. Maybe it's part of the way to scare us at the time that you just don't cross. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, or fortunately, I still have that behind my mind when I see a train, I'm, no, no, I don't want my car <laughs> drawn <laughs> in. <laughs> so so uh, just a suggestion that as we've seen on a truck, maybe 
something on this car, uh, rail cars. I know it might not be possible on each one, but at least to let people know the danger, even though people should know, but unfortunately we don't. It's actually a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> Christy Green, Town of Mossbank. Just a question on training for volunteer fire, fi fire departments. Yep. Um, would we be able to get together with other smaller communities to do something like that so we could have Absolutely. that opportunity? Absolutely. Uh, Doug Mayer is our dangerous goods officer for Saskatchewan. Uh, I'll get you his contact information. Uh, we actually, pref it's, it's a very effective use of our time to, to group it. And typically that's what we've done. <coughs> Um, we work at your hours too. It's not, you know, come give up your Saturday. Uh, most volunteer fire departments, I believe, use Tuesday as their training night. That's when we go. Okay, that would be perfect. We've just noticed a huge increase in um, yesterday. I was home all day, and from five o'clock until about, say, 10 when I was paying attention, I think we had five trains come yep. through. Um, so it has increased a lot, and we do have a great volunteer fire department we have all first responders right now and i just think it would be absolutely a opportunity walter strelaski i'm the mayor of the city of melville and we are a cn regional site a lot of traffic something like 40 trains a day possibly more on occasion w tell me about your school safety programs do you have a component that's part of say the driver ed program how does it work do you do that on an alt-call basis we have, uh, we fund, along with CN, uh, a program called Operation Lifesaver that has volunteers that go out into schools. Typically, they are uh, locomotive engineers or conductors, CP police officers, CN op police officers, and they go into the schools. We, we do, uh, on an annual basis, we do what's called Rail Safety Week. It comes up in April of, of this year. Uh, where we do heightened awareness, we do media, you name it. Um, the school training is uh, uh, is somewhat effective. Um, Operation Lifesaver has really shifted onto uh, social media platforms in the last couple of years, I think reflecting the reality of where kids are today. But you know, rail safety is not always, shall we say, top of mind for kids, for teenagers. Uh, and, and not necessarily the coolest thing that they're going to seek out on social media platforms. So it's a challenge that all of us share. Um, it used to be, I think, somewhat obvious. And I don't quite know why that common sense has gone away. Uh, but common sense would dictate that you just stay away from the tracks. It's easy. It's easy to remember. It's easy to do. Over time, that seems to have gone away somewhat. Now, I was dealing with last night, uh, we had a drunk driver in Pitt Meadows, British Columbia, who decided to turn onto the tracks um, and try and drive down the right of way. Um, he didn't get very far. But uh, any of you who have been out to Pitt Meadows know that's a pretty busy place for us. We have our large intermodal facility right there. We have the Coquitlam Yard, uh, which is our largest classification yard in Canada, right there. There's somewhere north of 60 trains a day. Uh, so that kind of interruption from somebody who's drunk it's not helpful. We had the same thing in Winnipeg Yard on New Year's Eve, only it was two cars and they drove into the side of a train. Uh, you know, common sense needs to play a part here. All of us can carry that message equally. I don't think it needs to be the railroads, and that would be my sort of concluding thought on that. Hi, Brian Ng, uh, City of Melford. Uh, not a real legal question or nothing like that, just more on technology for mm. these trains. Uh, if the cars themselves are kind of required to be upgraded, better bulkheads, better thicker walls, triple walls, things like that, what about the, the locomotives themselves? Uh, I sell cars for a living. I know the technology is there and getting better every day for them to 
automatically stop themselves if a pedestrian comes out in front, yep. uh, control themselves within the lines. That is on current vehicles right now. Do the locomotive companies now, is that something you guys build or is that contracted out? Um, we purchase, a uh, majority of our fleet is constructed by General Electric. Right. Um, the, uh, I know all of our road going fleet are GE. Um, these things today, a locomotive is essentially a giant air compressor. That's its primary function is to power the air brake system on the train. Um, if you get on board one, you will see that it has more in common with a 747 than it does a via a, a car. Uh, there are any number of sensors on board that monitor everything in real time. That information, that data is transmitted in real time both to our locomotive operations center and to GE. They are so that we can, we can diagnose well underway uh, if they have a problem. Again, keeping in mind the last thing we want to do is stop the train, especially for a mechanical problem. Um, and block that crossing. And block that crossing. <laughs> putting, putting the crew in violation of the rule. Um, the, um, there's also a lot of wayside technology that monitors the train underway. Plus, we have uh, locomotive cams uh, that point outwards. Uh, we are trying to get in-cab uh, in cameras and uh, voice recorders permitted currently under pri federal privacy legislation. They are not allowed. Um, we're trying to get an exemption from that. Um, I'm not sure what the difference is actually between the airlines, which are also federally regulated, and railroads, but for privacy purposes, there is a difference. Uh, it would be, in our view, helpful to reconstruct incidents to have that voice, certainly to have that voice recorder. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount of technology involved in the locomotive. Um, the United States has brought in something called positive train control, which is now in the implementation phase where locomotives will be remote. You'll have the ability to remotely control the, the locomotive from the operations center. The idea being if for some reason the crew were incapacitated, uh, this came out of a couple of, of train incidents uh, in the States, uh, one in Chatsworth, California, it, that involved an Amtrak, I think it was an Amtrak, and a Burlington Northern train where there were many, many fatalities. Um, the technology isn't fully developed yet. People say, well, why don't you use GPS? GPS requires line of sight. And if you live in my part of the world, uh, out on the coast, we have an awful lot of tunnels, including at CP, the longest rail tunnel in North America under Mount McDonald. GPS doesn't work so well inside those tunnels. So the system that is being developed is radio-based. Uh, for us, the implementation alone, and keep in mind, we're the smallest of the big North American railroads, the implementation for us is half a billion dollars. And that's on our American network. Um, will Canada adopt it? We hope not. Uh, we're not particular fans of this technology. It's mandated in the States, so we'll do it. We need to be in compliance with the rules. My name is Nancy Stiles, and I'm, from, I'm a counselor from the city of Weyburn. And of course, CP Rail uh, goes through Weyburn, and there we have three controlled uh, crossings there. No, four, sorry, four. And I guess I have a, because you don't, you obviously don't like crossings at all, one of the things that I would like to see, if, if possible, in the future, I haven't, I haven't raised any money for it yet, but uh, Tadical Parkway is one of the seven urban parks in Saskatchewan, and our trail, our trails, mm -hmm. there is no, there's, there's not a natural hookup, but there could be a natural hookup to go from one part of it to the other if we had a controlled pedestrian crossing uh, near Barber Motors. And I mean, does would would CP have any flavor to to work with the city of Weyburn to to get that pedestrian crossing? And I mean, I've seen these; they they are controlled. They have gates that go yep. clunk shut. So I mean, if a train's coming through, it's it's perfectly safe. So 
Would, would CP have any flavor to, to work with the city of Weyburn to get a controlled pedestrian crossing for Tadigal Parkway? Nancy, the last thing we want to see is another crossing in Weyburn. No, <laughs> c uh, candidly. Um, that said, you could work on, you could upgrade crossings just to the north of the park. It's, pre it's in pretty close proximity. But there was a reason I kind of alluded to Weyburn in that, in that other slide. Uh, the north end of the city, you've got Queen Street, mm -hmm. which is uncontrolled. Uh, right on a curve, what is it, maybe 15 feet from Highway 39, mm -hmm. maybe? It'll, uh, Queen Street will never survive the, uh, the grade cross in review. It, it won't. It'll get... I'm not looking at that. I know. <laughs> but, but the point is, we've got to deal with what we've got. Uh, and there are options in Weyburn in terms of locating uh, a proper pedestrian crossing, if you will, right where the existing controlled crossings are. Adding another crossing in the middle of the park is, uh, is, not, is not actually a step forward and further tightens up our ability to operate. Now there's enough, you know, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that in that, what is it, 500 feet between the two crossings, if we were to put the cross, another crossing in, wouldn't change our operation. But the reality is we need fewer crossings, not more of them. What we should be looking at for the medium to long term in Weyburn, and I would argue in many other communities, is for a grade separation. That is the safest type of crossing. Um, there is a tremendous amount of infrastructure money out there uh, from, uh, from other orders of government. Uh, those budgets are going up. Uh, CP wants to be your advocate in terms of garnering one in your community. And I think that is, that's where we should be focusing our attention. Had to ask. Fair enough. <laughs> Knew it was coming. Hello, uh, Tracy Yowsey, town of Kalonze. My question is, uh, how many firefighters in the province of Saskatchewan have the Railway 101 safety program to date, and how else can this information be related to us in an emergency situation if we do not have the safety program? I don't know the number in Saskatchewan. Uh, the number system-wide is the number I, I do have off the top of my head. Uh, and that is uh, 2,300, just over 2,300 first responders since we started this program a few years ago. Um, in Colonse directly, I don't believe we have done the Railroad 101 training. I don't believe it's been requested. It's something that should happen. Yeah, so we are a main line for yep. CP. Yeah, so um, let's, let's deal with that offline, you and me. But obviously, we're keen to do it. Uh, it'll be our dangerous goods officer, Doug Mayer, who leads that training. Uh, and uh, um, that information, that's contact information that your fire chief should okay. have. No, yeah, I guess what I'm asking really is if in a disaster happened tomorrow, yep. can we obtain the information on what's on those, the car that's yes. burning and the cars? That oh, is this, a uh, this is a good question, Darren. I, I think he the just <laughs> gave you a hat. The... Uh, <laughs> That information has always been on board the train. What the, 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 the disclosure requirements that have happened since Lac McGonick did not change that. So I, as a conductor, when I take my train, I print out a document called a compressed way bill that has the dangerous goods information for every dangerous good contained in that, on that train. I keep that information in my possession should, a first, should an incident occur. My job is to transmit that information to the first responders arriving at the scene. The documentation is backed up in our computer system and can be, uh, can be communicated over, the, you know, let's say I get incapacitated. Yep. How do you know what that information is? You can get that through the CP police service. Uh, transmitted over the phone, by fax, by email. The, the documentation is backed up. So there's numerous ways that were pre-existing to transmit the information 
That hasn't changed. What the app does, what the Protective Directive 3.2 do, is they give you enhanced information. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, Corbin Meyer, Councillor Town of Langham. I can't take your hat because I don't want to offend the conductors out there. We're on the CN main line. <laughs> but the um, uh, question is, uh, have you ever seen or uh, do you know of even in maybe even a major urban center in the States? Um, if Because I live probably within that area that you're talking about where land was cheap. And I mean, it's a small community, so that's just where it is. But yep. it's within a few hundred meters of the track. And uh, so my question is, have you ever seen a, any anybody build sidewalls up as a preventative to, uh, like in a narrow corridor where residences or, or schools or something are, are really close? Could you build a sidewall to protect, to prevent an accident from happening? I haven't seen a one designed for, uh, d for dangerous goods containment, let's say. What I have seen is uh, sound attenuation walls. We've got them in a number of locations uh, along along CP lines, um, and the, uh, the the proximity guidelines, though, to your question, they do address that in in uh, in part, uh, and they do provide some design standards for. Uh, it's mostly geared towards sound attenuation, sound attenuation yeah. but they do they do address that directly. Thank you. Guy Pulvermacher, uh, Councillor for the Town of Bruno. We're on uh, one of the main uh, CN lines, uh, a lot of freight going through. We have a uh, fairly small volunteer fire department, brand new fire chief, half of our members have joined within the last year. What are three points you can uh, give us on how to get our team up to speed and the most important way to train them in the most effective way in a short time when they're already doing a lot of training, yep. just become effective? The, the training that, that CN offers, identical training to what I spoke about. Best way to get that is to request it. Uh, CN has a public information line. It, the email and uh, phone number are on their website, cn.ca. Uh, make that request. This is, it's good, it's good knowledge for your, uh, for your fire department to have. Uh, in our case, and I believe it's true for CN as well, uh, we, don't, we don't say meet us in Regina on X and X date and we'll train you. We come to your training night, typically they're Tuesday nights, uh, and do the training directly. We bring the equipment necessary for the training with us. Mm -hmm. um, we do like to pool it uh, with uh, adjoining fire departments. It just makes sense from a mutual aid perspective. Uh, it's also a good use of time for everybody. But beyond that, we'll bring the training to you. And I, I do know CN does the same thing. Uh, my question goes a little bit further than just the training. Um, what are the, the two or three things that our fire chief needs to know that are most important for him to do his job effectively? Uh, you know, for instance, these websites or, right. or having that app or that sort of gotcha. thing. Gotcha. The, the first thing is um, safety of the first responders. Don't approach, don't approach a situation that you can't first assess. Mm -hmm. we, follow, we follow the same incident command hierarchy as everybody, as, as all first responders. So that is safety of first response, safety of the surrounding community, protection of the environment, returning back into service. Those are the, those are the four steps. If you don't know what you're looking at, you know, if you can't see the placard on the rail car, you don't know what that car contains, maybe there's a cloud, maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just lying on its side. You need to get that information. How do you get that? If you don't know, go find the crew at the head end. If you can't find the crew, call the, call the emergency line. So those are the three things. Thank you. I want to see the hat first. <laughs> it's very feminine. I am Sylvia Meljohn. I am mayor of the town of Unity. We have CN and we have CP. You have come out with the training. It was wonderful. Thank you. We are a town 
built between two rail lines. We have a half a dozen railroad crossings, and we have two major highways within a one kilometer square area of town. We have been um, lobbying for, in the name of safety, a different access to a provincial highway 21 because of safety. We have been doing this for over 20 years, and we're getting nowhere not too fast. So, I'm thinking the light bulb went on, and at the head top of this Highway 21 coming into our town mm -hmm. is an uncontrolled railway crossing with your railroad, which also presents a huge safety factor, which we don't know what's on the train. I mean, we do know, but we don't know at the moment. And we don't know what's in those semis coming and going very often, very um, with retarder brakes. I, I get anxiety thinking about it, and I'm not a warrior. So perhaps we're, we need to lobby CP also. Unity is... A great town. It's a terrific town. Right. <laughs> it's a terrific town. But it is a poster child. It is a poster child for how not to build highways. Oh, yes. That's why we're called and, Unity. And... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I can't justify the decisions of the provincial government on this one. That... That road should have been grade separated years ago. But I'm talking, what are your decisions now to right. provide safety to our town? Because you have as many on your line hauling dangerous goods, yep. right? Uh, well, that's, that's how you make your money. That's how we have safety con concerns. Yep. I'm very comfortable with the operation that we have, our observance of the rules, our enforcement of the rules. Mm -hmm. I am very uncomfortable with somebody driving on the highway trying to beat the train over the Highway 21 crossing. To my mind, that's the risk. When we look at CP, we have made investments in grade crossings. Mm -hmm. um, we look at it on business case. This is how we decide whether or not to contribute to somebody's product project. If we can obtain some operational savings through the elimination of that crossing, then there is the uh, then we have a good business case to make internally to provide some funding for that project. For the most part, quite honestly, it's a pretty tenuous business case from our perspective. That doesn't change the public safety issue. It doesn't change the con the convenience issue for residents, mm -hmm. and that's where we think we need to do a good job of verifying you as you advance a request to the provincial road authority, to the federal government who has a lot of money for these sorts of trade-related uh, um, trade related infrastructure projects. Uh, good case in point for us is the city of Edmonton. Uh, any of you who uh, know the southern boundary of Edmonton know that there's been a giant construction site for the last couple of years as they have built a very big <coughs> overpass over Highway 2 and over the CP Main Line. Uh, our contribution to that project, and the project goes back about seven years now, uh, our contribution to it was our lobbying effort. Uh, and it was recognized as such in the project agreement that CP would be a verifier for this project, which was deemed to be in the, in the national interest in terms of infrastructure. That's easy for us to do, and it's a role we should do. But we have to be, but you have to involve us in that. You and the town of Unity taking on an overpass project all by yourself is one, a severe financial burden on your budget, and two, is not beyond the obvious public safety benefit, um, I would argue you shouldn't be going alone, that you should be getting other government sources of funding. 
and they're out there. So let's work together on it. I need your name and number. Thank you. <laughs> Done. Your Worship, the, no question better than another question, but you did call Mike Taffy feminine, so you get that. <laughs> Hi, my name is Samantha, and I am the CAO for the Village of Sedley, <coughs> which is along the longest, straightest piece of railway. <laughs> Yes. In the province of Saskatchewan, which is managed by or owned by a Shoreline Railway. Yep. Will CP do emergency training for first responders along a railway that belongs to somebody else? Under mutual aid, yes. We will we will respond. Um, but do we do the training? It depends. If we're asked to. Um, and, and some short lines have asked us to do training. We will. Uh, we do it on a cost recovery basis. Uh, but in terms of emergency response, it's done on mutual aid. We have mutual aid agreement with the other railroads. Um, the issue of short lines came up in the earlier session as well. Uh, and in regulation around short lines, you know, when, when short lines were created, the policy for short lines was created many years ago. It was largely to keep country elevators in service where they were no longer economic for the large class ones to service. And, and you know, you can appreciate we have a very high, high cost basis to our operation. We have to meet certain standards. We have significant capital expenditures. We're expensive. A country short line was there to keep the, the prairie elevators in service when we could no longer justify the cost of service. We're not in the business of subsidizing. Uh, that's not how we make money. In fact, that's how we lose money, and we don't want to do that. Um, so now Bach and Crude comes along, uh, and suddenly short lines are thrust into a position that they weren't really designed for out of the box. Uh, and yeah, it's, we have some concerns. We've certainly talked to the government of Saskatchewan about that. Uh, we believe in particular, you know, similar, the, the railroad in Lac Magonic was a short, deemed a short line. It was a national short line because it crossed provincial and uh, international boundaries, but it was deemed a short line in terms of its size. Uh, at the time, the insurance requirement for short lines nationally was $25 million, the, the liability requirement. Uh, and obviously that money was spent in about 15 minutes. Um, I believe in Saskatchewan, the uh, provincial regulation mirrors the federal regulation. There's recently been some movement on that front to increase the liability burden a lot of the short lines acted, they didn't wait. They've upped their liability, uh, their liability insurance directly, not waiting for the regulation to tell them what to do. Uh, so, but this is an ongoing issue. It is one, as I said, we have expressed some concern to, uh, to the province of Saskatchewan about, uh, with good reason. Some of you may be aware uh, that we originated the train that derailed in Lac Magonic. We originated that train in North Dakota. Uh, we are currently being sued by the province of Quebec for $400 million. We had nothing to do with the operation of the Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. We are required under Canadian law to interchange with them. When we chose not to interchange with them post Lac Magonic, they uh, they hauled us before the Canadian Transportation Agency, which ordered us to resume interchange. Um, and, and, you know, whatever you think of those facts, uh, recognize this. You don't, at the end of the day, as a railroad, you don't want us to decide whether or not to move the chlorine th that is required for your town water supply, water filtration plant. Better that the common carrier obligation ap apply, better that the Rail Safety Act apply, and we are required to move all commodities, including dangerous goods, and do so safely. But as it pertains to short lines, there's more to talk about. 
and and it's not it's not regulation that touches us directly, but uh, downstream it could touch us, as in the case of this lawsuit. So we have, as I said, we've expressed some concerns. We will, on a mutual aid basis, provide support, uh, and on a cost recovery basis, we would provide training. And uh, that request would have to come from the short line, or yeah, from the short line to us. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Samantha. I don't see any other people ready for questions. Nancy, did you have a second one? No. No. <laughs> no I'm just trying to, you know, stick with you. I'm Absolutely. Very, very yeah, we still have. Like we got loads of time. Half hour. Lots of time. Lots of time. Vince Labos, your cut knife. I would. Uh, it's, uh, I have a little question, but you've sure done your homework, and you've, you've done a real good presentation here today. I know you're out of hats, so don't worry. I'm not. <laughs> you still get funny. a pen. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, on the topic of infrastructure, especially the roads, which you brought up, and I can see how it's a big concern of yours, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the railway company. I'd like to point out the obvious too. Have you noticed some of the implements that the farmers are pulling out in the field today? Yes. Large ammonia tanks and large trains, well beyond the gravel roads engineered specs. Yep. Bridges. All the, all the like. So the challenges are not just CPs. They are an overall concern. But you are speaking to a room of people who represent ratepayers. Yes. And there was a time when we perceived the need, we could address it in our budgetary approach. But in the last century, things were introduced, like income tax and so on, where it gives larger governments a bypass approach to the wealth of the commoner. So vis-a-vis -vis these areas of ma major infrastructure dollars, uh, we are challenged. The budgets of our RMs are challenged. And I think you've noticed some improvements. It just can't happen all overnight. And there's, of course, we have the haves and the have-not RMs, right? Those that can have funding and those that cannot. Um, I just would like to point out a perspective. We discovered in Wilton and in uh, Hill Hillsdale, and I'm not speaking as an authority, I'm just saying I'm a trucker in the oil patch. And we decided to pull tri-axle tri trailers, finding out that it was wrecking our intersections. And then we really looked at the cost and the rates we were being paid and so on, the economy of it. And we really discovered that pulling tandems were more cost effective at the end of the day, but we're still pulling tri-axles. Tri right. So profitability, cannot just take the view of the one hand. Because in order for the triaxle to be sustainable, it means the taxpayer has to pay more money in infrastructure on those roads so that the oil company and the trucking companies can make more profit. Same with CP. We want to improve, we want safety. There, you don't have to preach it, we, we want it. But the kind of dollars we're looking at to get some change happening in a five to 10 year window. And your notions that there is more money available. On our council, we don't see it. Right. But I hope your assumptions are a good forecast of things to come. But we're under a, a big challenge facing us in the next few years here with not just the low oil price, but it's, it's gonna feel through the whole system. If, if, if I could, uh, the easiest expenditure to make is not to make an expenditure. Um, it's not for me to dictate how you divvy up your funds, but particularly for RMs. In many cases, you know, if we go back to that slide, uh, where is it? There. I'm just going to ask the question, do you really need that many crossings? Typically, you are junior at the crossing which is a very arcane formula that the Canadian Transportation Agency came up with to divvy up costs for maintenance. Those costs typically fall on the road authority, which was that which put in the road post installation of the mainline track. Uh, so I'm going to ask the question, do you need to maintain all that road, all those roads? Or do you simply say, you know what? This, in the most, and you know, you and I both know, in many cases, 
they are theoretical roads. They're not even actually roads. But they're still a crossing there. We still come in every number of years and do the, uh, do the plank replacement and send you the bill uh, at the end. Do we need to spend all that money? I, I, my guess is we don't, but it's actually your decision. So all I would say is take it back and look at it in your jurisdiction and make some informed decisions. Yes, sir. And I was trying to connect the the dynamic of if the RM proved that pulling tandem trailers yep. was more cost effective, your profit and taxpayer combined, yep. right? Trying to take the bigger view of things. We now have trains of a mile long. Why not two miles long? I'm just saying maybe part of profitability is not having to pull such big trains on the kind of train tracks we have currently in use. That's the reason we don't have two mile long trains. Uh, C CP, our typical, uh, our typical siding is roughly 7,800 feet long. That precludes a two, long, a two mile long train. That's about a mile and a half. Uh, we have, over the last four or so years, had a, had a very focused program on lengthening out sidings. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Centennial, just south of uh, Estevan, which is now a 12,000-foot-long siding. Uh, there's relatively few places in the network where we can build one that long because of the grade crossings and the, and the fact that we can't occupy a crossing for more than five minutes. And if you're going to do a train meet, odds are you're there for more than five minutes. Uh, so we build them where we can. Uh, what a longer train means is fewer trains. There's a very direct correlation there. They're certainly a more efficient train to operate. Uh, so good for our business uh, and good for our neighbors in the fact that instead of having two trains come through, you have one. And at track speed, that extra 4,000 feet, 3,000 feet is going to go by pretty quickly. Um, so we like longer trains. That's certainly the trend in the business. But we're somewhat capacity limited right now in terms of being able to have a long train. Uh, that's why you don't see them all going out at 12,000 feet. Technologically, there's, uh, in terms of the locomotive, in terms of the train control, there's no reason uh, not to. We actually, uh, for grain trains going across northern Ontario for a while, we were stapling together two 113-car grain trains and putting them across over the Great Lakes as one train. Um, these are monsters, 226 cars, about three miles long. They ran beautifully. Uh, but, but, the, uh, but you've got to have the infrastructure to be able to get two trains to meet, which is not an issue with trucking, where typically, uh, even if it's a, even if it's a uh, range road, there's enough space for two trucks to pass each other at speed. You sit in quorums and forums that, that we as people don't are not privy to, so I just wanted to give you the human perspective of the rate payer. I appreciate and that, that. And that it's about available tax dollars and it's about quality of life. A mile-plus train covers two intersections, yep. not one. Just saying profitability of the corporation cannot be viewed in isolation of quality of life and meaningful living for citizens. And I just wanted you to, I wanted to thank SUMA for having the opportunity to even as a shepherd of the people, if you will, elected shepherd, to be able to bring that kind of um, dialogue to you, trusting, again, because of your presentation, you have done your homework, and I hope you don't lose that human uh, component <coughs> to your roundtable discussions. Thank you. I do think that uh, this is a nice way to wrap up the session, and I do want to say a personal thank you to, to you, Mike. You uh, have certainly taken this job on, but more so, Mike, I want to say how much I personally appreciate the fact that you make yourself so available to us in Saskatchewan. You have probably touched as many of the municipalities are sitting in this room, if not more, and the fact that when a question was asked of you today, 
the buck stops with you and you say, that's mine, I'll deal with that. And that's the way that I have found you to work in all of the dealings that I've had with you in the city of Weyburn and certainly through SUMA. And certainly when you were asked to come and give this presentation, you were very quick to, to take that opportunity and come and speak to us. So I wanna say a huge thank you personally to you. And I wanna end on the note that we really appreciate the fact that Canadian Pacific brings the holiday train to Weyburn through Saskatchewan every year. And this year in particular, as our economy has been a little challenged, those food banks are more than needed. And I hope that you would take that message back to whoever needs to hear it, keep that holiday train rolling through. It fills the shelves in Weyburn, not just at Christmas time, but beyond and throughout the year. We're able to use that cash for, for fresh vegetables and fruits for our residents. So thank you very much, two thumbs up. Thank you very much.